Well, it's now time uh, for our uh, basic science lecture. Um, we'd like to uh, uh, introduce uh, Dr. Michael Cowley. Uh, I think he's going to present a, a very stimulating topic, something that uh, can hopefully give us an idea as to why all of these procedures uh, that we do work, how do they decrease hunger, and, and that's the, the topic of nutrient sensing and, and hypothalamic neurons. How does the gut talk to the brain? Uh, we welcome him uh, from Australia. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and uh, particularly uh, grateful to the program committee for the chance. So I'm going to talk to you today about work that my lab's been conducting over the past 10 years here in the States and recently since we moved back to Australia, looking at how the hypothalamus senses levels of nutrients in the body and in particular I'm going to focus on how signals from the gut inform the brain about both nutrient stores and also nutrient levels within the gut and we're going to focus in particular on how in that context we can understand how therapies work and develop new therapies to treat obesity. Obviously I have some disclosures to make. I, I, particularly point out that I'm the founder of Orexigen Therapeutics and so it's probably worth considering that when we're interpreting some of the things I say. We're going to talk in particular around this circuit map here which describes the proopium melanocortin neurons and the neuropeptide Y or GUTI related peptide neurons. And over the past 10 years these neurons have become the focus of considerable attention trying to understand how these particular neuronal populations detect signals from the body. And my lab's been instrumental in creating this map, if you will, the circuit map of the hypothalamus, whereby melanocortin neurons send a signal up to the melanocortin-4 receptor expressing neurons and how neuropeptide Y or related peptide neurons send an antagonist to the same site and how we integrate the two signals and how sen sen sensory modalities like PYY levels like ghrelin, leptin, insulin and GLP-1 all feed into these two neuronal populations to inform the brain about stored nutrients and then how the brain uses that information to make decisions that drive appetite and energy expenditure. And in particular I'm going to talk about leptin because leptin was really the, the focus of the early work in this field. It led us to understand these circuits, to, to map these circuits and it's been the prototypical signal that we've compared everything else to. There's three tiers to the normal response to leptin in an animal. There's a behavioural effect whereby increased leptin levels cause decreased appetite. There's an endocrine effect whereby systems that engage in energy consumption are encouraged and then there's an effect on the autonomic nervous system whereby the sympathetic nervous system is activated and the parasympathetic nervous system is suppressed and this leads to increased energy expenditure. The net effect of all this is to decrease body weight of course. However it's worth remembering that that's clearly not happening in obesity and, and so we're trying to understand what it is that goes wrong. So as I said we're going to focus on the proopium melanocortin neurons and the neuropeptide Y agouti related peptide neurons. These neuropeptide Y agouti related peptide neurons produce two signals, neuropeptide Y and AGRP, which are both potent stimulators of appetite when they're injected directly into the brain. Whereas the POMC neurons produce alpha MSH, a molecule that binds to the melanocortin 4 receptor and which inhibits appetite and increases energy expenditure. So we're setting up this two-fold system with a common target, the melanocortin 4 receptor. AGRP is an antagonist to the MC4 receptor and alpha MSH is an agonist of that MC4 receptor. And so when we think about how drugs act on this circuit, we have to think about both pathways. One of the tools we used to conduct this work was the proopium melanocortin GFP transgenic mouse. This is a, a transgenic animal that we made at the Volum Institute in Oregon, which expresses a, a fluorescent marker just in a particular population of cells, in, in this case in the POMC cells. And we can use that fluorescent marker to detect those cells in living tissue. And when we find those cells in living tissue, we can then record electrical activity in them or look at drug effects upon those individual cells. This is quite important because there's only about 3,000 of these neurons in the mouse or the human brain. And so it literally was like looking for a needle in a haystack prior to the development of this technology. So we take the brains out of these animals, be they lean or obese animals, we cut slices of them, very fine slices, and we, we drop them down onto a stage of a microscope and by changing the, the bathing solution that the tissue is kept in, we can infer endocrine effects on those cells just like what happened in the body. And so, for example, if we, we change the solution over to one that contains leptin, we can analyse what leptin would do to those green neurons. 
And what you see here is an example of that. This is the fluorescent neuron, so there's under fluorescence illumination, and the tip of the electrical recording device is highlighted in red here. You can see here without the fluorescent lamp, there's, it's almost impossible to detect the cell. And in particular, it's impossible to distinguish it from the 30 or 40 around it that are non-fluorescent. And so using this, we can identify the neurons for electrical recording. With that technology, we applied leptin to the tissue and we found in, in this paper in Nature that we could demonstrate that leptin electrically activated these neurons. What you see here is an electrophysiological recording of membrane potential or the cell's electrical potential and the upward deflections here represent action potentials. And if we hark back to our neurophysiology courses, we know that this dense band of action potentials here is going to be driving secretion of the neuropeptide, the protein inside that cell. And that, so that POM C neuron is conveying a signal to somewhere else in the brain and it's releasing alpha MSH. And when we take the brains out of these mice and look at alpha MSH secretion, what we see here is that as we increase leptin concentrations, we increase alpha MSH secretion. So leptin is electrically activating the neurons and it's increasing their secretory activity. So we're beginning to build a circuit map for how leptin's acting in the brain. We took the opposite, well, the same approach in the opposite population of neurons and we looked at the neuropeptide Y agouti related peptide neurons. We marked these with neuropeptide Y neurons with a sapphire green fluorescent protein. This is a mouse that my, my friend Jeff Friedman at the Rockefeller made. What we see here is that when we apply leptin, we see a hyperpolarization, so the cells become more electronegative, and you can see that the action potentials completely stop. So leptin is inhibiting the neuropeptide Y agouti related peptide neurons. And when we look at peptide secretion from those cells, what we see here is that as leptin levels increase, both AGRP levels secretion decreases, as does neuropeptide Y secretion. So we have a situation where leptin is activating one population of neurons and increasing its peptide secretion and inhibiting another population of neurons and decreasing the peptide secretion. Using that basic premise and that, that circuit map we set up, we analysed how ghrelin acted on the circuit. What we show here is that when we look at the activity of the neuropeptide Y goody related peptide neurons, when ghrelin is applied during this dark band here, you can see there's a roughly three or four fold increase in the cellular activity of these neurons. We also used this circuit map to discover how the hormone peptide YY acted. Prior to this work, we'd known that PYY was a factor released by the gut, but we thought it had a role in gastric transit. What we predicted, based on the electrophysiological work, was that peptide YY3 to 36 would have a role in inducing satiety. And what we found is that when we put PYY on the brain slice, it inhibited the activity of neuropeptide Y neurons. So you see here, the pretreatment area, PYY is applied during this band here, and you can see how there's a rapid decrease in the activity of the cells. This follows that also that these cells stop secreting neuropeptide Y and a GUI-related peptide. And so in a follow-on paper, in a preclinical model, we looked at the effect of PYY in obese monkeys. And what we found here is that PYY infused intravenously caused decreases in food intake, at least in the morning meal, and as you see over here, a very minor effect on body weight. So these are the, the saline treated animals and progressively increasing doses of PYY3 to 36, similar to the levels that were infused in the, in the early human study. But with chronic infusion, we found that the weight loss was rather modest. We also found that PYY only inhibited food intake at supraphysiological concentrations, concentrations such that we were approaching the limit of tolerability and that many of the animals became nauseous. And so we proposed that the narrow therapeutic index of PYY would render it not particularly useful as a human therapeutic. And I think the recent clinical trial data that's been enrolled has sort of backed up that interpretation.